previously on balls. Well, uh, under the circumstances, I mean, it's uh, it's nice to be able to catch up with uh, with Louis Junior uh, this afternoon. But obviously, under the circumstances, a very very sad time uh, for for their family. And uh, yeah, I mean, rugby has just lost one of the. Uh, one of the most high-profile and effective uh, figures that South African gamers uh, has seen, right up there with the likes of Dr. Donny Craven, and that is uh, Dr. Louis Leitz. Louis, how are you doing? I'm okay. Thanks a lot, Louis, are you there? Thanks for those kind words. Yes, I'm here. Oh, sorry, I've got you now. Now I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome. Yeah, no, yeah, under, under the circumstances, a difficult time, but yeah, thanks for the kind words, Darren. We really appreciate it. Well, I mean, you know, everyone had a, a very specific. There was no doubting a relationship with your with your dad. Um, you know, man, no matter who you speak to, people that have, that you know uh, crossed his path in one way or the other during during their lives. And I suppose he was one of those those people you either liked him or you don't. Or you had respect for him, and some. And I mean, there would be some people that didn't have any time for him as well. Um, we spoke to him just recently on on the show, and he was always really willing to take our calls and to chat and. Uh, and he's, uh, you know, he was always concerned personally about about ourselves and 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 how we were doing and stuff. So uh, it, it really was sad because I think the last time we spoke to him, he'd actually said next time down in Durban, going to pop through and come and have a cup of tea with him. So you know that's not going to happen. But uh, yeah, our sincere condolences to you and and your family on your loss. No, I appreciate it, Darren. And the one thing that I think that you know that he had a tremendous fondness of you. Yeah. Um, he enjoyed the discussions that you guys had, and he was always willing to talk to you. And uh, yeah, you know there are people out there, or were people out there that didn't like him. But the funny thing is that once he left rugby, a lot of attitudes changed, and it was fantastic for him to hear sometimes how people said that they miss him yeah. and they wish that he was back in the game and, and and those sort of things. But the memories will always be there, and I think the impact that he left on the sport and also just society in general is, is, is tremendous from us as a family. Mm. Obviously, we feel it, you know, quite a bit. In, it's a fantastic, you know, thing for us to have had a father of his, his stature. And, uh, you know, we couldn't be more proud of him. I think one of the things that struck me about him when, when people said, you know, what was it like interviewing him and what, and what, and what was he like? Uh, it, it immediately struck me as that no, no matter who you were, he didn't like people that pussyfooted around him. So if you were going to engage him, you spoke directly to him with respect. But you, and if you had a question, ask him a question directly. You always knew you were going to get an answer from him as well, a direct answer. And I, I'll never forget the one time, and, and you were just saying you, you guys had watched some of uh, an interview we'd done on Supersport from a long time ago, uh, again yeah. recently. I'll never forget one of the key moments when uh, when I was interviewing him, and I, I, your dad always used to like when he was maybe put off his. Uh, you were trying to put him off his stride a little bit and sort of get in there because he wasn't an easy man to get off his stride. Uh, he would throw back a question with another question, and I'll never forget the one day when all the drama was going on about, you know, he's corrupt and this, that, and the other. And I said to him, "Are you corrupt, Doctor Late?" And he just looked at me and said, "Define corruption." <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly, yeah. True, very true. He would throw that back at you. Yeah. But that's what he did exactly the same thing. I mean, in a radio interview, when he entered politics, I mean, the, the one gentleman said to him, there are not many people out there like you. He says, well, you know, there are a lot of people that do. He said, but what, uh, you know, he said basically, if uh, 50% of the people didn't vote for you, or more than 50% of the people didn't vote for you, what then? He says, well, then the other 50% would probably be voting for me. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, he would always have an answer back for somebody, but uh, you're right. He doesn't he didn't mess around he answered things straight and the one thing about him which you know we learned from him is if there's bad news give it to me straight yeah. because he never liked to hear bad news after the fact he said you give me the bad news yes I'm going to be cross I'm going to probably explode but by the end of the day we deal with it and we move on and that's the type of person that he was mm. Daddy mellowed a lot in his later years I mean I had chatted to him a few times when he was sort of uh, taking life a lot easier down on the coast in uh, in the Belito area there and I mean, obviously, he had a lot of uh, health issues that he was dealing with as well. But just as a as a person, had he had he mellowed at all? Completely, Darren. You know what? He actually started enjoying his life. He expanded his horizons in terms of you know doing things that he enjoyed. You know, he loved the law. He also loved reading up on the law, um, and just you know keeping up to date with certain things. He um, he loved obviously following economics and. He entered into debate with a lot of the economists. You know, you'd be on the phone with David Meads and a whole lot of the guys, you know, just talking about, you know, where the country was and all those sorts of things. And, yeah, he mellowed, he relaxed, he enjoyed himself, 
he enjoyed his grandchildren. That was one of the major things in his life. You know, people tend to think of him as this hard person. But when it came to his children, and especially his grandchildren, he loved to have them around. He loved to joke with them um, and just enjoy their company. Uh, so he mellowed, and, and from that perspective, you know, he, he, people also in the community here started seeing him differently. I mean, you know as well as I do that the charts people never, never looked fondly upon my dad in the beginning. Mm. But when he came here, funnily enough, they were more bigger supporters to, for, of him than the Lions were when he was up there. Yeah. Um, the people embraced him. I mean, you go look at guys like Brian Van Sale and the boys at the Natal Rugby Union. They often invited him to come to games. He didn't go often because of, of the fact that he was getting uh, you know, on an age and he didn't want to do the long distances and walking and so forth. But he enjoyed the fact that he still had that interaction with people. Was he a shock supporter eventually? <laughs> he was a bull supporter Yay. eventually. Oh, way. really? <laughs> yeah. uh, he became a bull supporter, would you believe it or not? Wow. Because he, uh, he, uh, he had a fondness for, you know, and he's got lots of friends up there, you know, the yeah. Fricted Priors, the Ulof de Mayers, and all those guys. And those are the people, Pete Ace, and those are the guys that, that stayed in touch with him and communicated with him. And, uh, yes, he played for Free State for 50, with 54 games and he captained Free State. He played for Northerns twice. Uh, but, um, you know, Rugby was close to his heart. Yeah. But saying that, he also became disillusioned. Um, yeah. You know, he used to watch all the rugby matches, but he became, became very disillusioned as to where Rugby was going in the end. And um, his, his uh, advice was go back to the first format, go back to a Super 10. Rather reduce the number of teams, reduce the size of the competition, make it exclusive, make it what it should be, and that you, know, that you earn your place, and that you don't automatically get promoted into the game, as, as is happening at the moment. Look, there's no doubt, we were saying just before, uh, before about five, ten minutes before we phoned you, we were just chatting about it, and saying, look, people liked him or they didn't like him, as well, but it wasn't about personalities. When it came to your dad, uh, it was about the business of rugby. He was a businessman. He, he came into rugby having had a history in the game, but he brought the business side of rugby there. And and, and that was one thing that was pretty clear. There's no, no one can doubt him, no matter what you thought about the doc, that, that he didn't do a good job when it came to the business of rugby. And sometimes he had to make unpopular decisions and do unpopular things. But, you know, when we spoke to him last time on this show, was around the whole Lions debacle. And, and I mean, the point was clear when he left there, and he made the point. He left there with a, a union that was, what, 85 million in the black. Absolutely. And I think they're 85 million now in the red, or whatever the, the amount was at the time. And he was like, what happened? How do you lose that much money? Where's the money gone? With him, you knew where you stood, and you knew exactly what was going on. With, uh, you know, and, 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 and those are the kind of things I think that people saw, despite whether they liked him or not. You know, if, if somebody, and he said, no one has contacted me, no one cared about my opinion about what we should do, or how, you know, what's happened to this union and how we can get it right again, even though he did make it clear he's always been there and he's always been available. Well, you know, the funny thing about that, Dan, you say that now. Um, I think Oregon Hoskins phoned him once or twice, Kevin DeClerc phoned him a couple of times, a couple of guys phoned him. And the funny thing is, he was willing to give them the advice. They yeah. never came down. They never wanted to listen. Mm. And by the end of the day, he said, listen, if they don't want my advice, I'm not going to give the advice. I'm not forcing myself on them. I'm, I'm out of rugby. If they want to talk to me, I'm there. And I'm very happy to assist them. But he wouldn't force himself on anybody. And like you said, yes, he changed the game. I mean, I mean if you take back where professionalism actually started, it was when he allowed Mnet to come into Alice Park country to the FABC agreement and he gave the effort, he gave Mnet the opportunity to get their foothold into South African sport by allowing to broadcast the Transvaal Western Province match. That was when the professional era actually started and people didn't actually realize that because he negotiated a whole new deal uh, for television and then it went on further to the New Sport deal and all those sorts of things. And like you said, he was a businessman. He, was, he wanted to make sure that the success of the of the sports was there and that is what what was called to him and and he loved it and then, and that's one thing what he said if you wanted to administrate in rugby you actually had to have played rugby and understand rugby mm. you can't have people that didn't understand the game uh coming to the game uh you know his famous saying was of some people he said they never even kicked a, a, a rugby ball in anger you know so you've got to understand the game and he understood the game but he was a businessman first and foremost yes he had failures, there's no two ways about it, but he always came back and he always wanted to prove himself as a businessman first and foremost by the end of the day. 
What I mean, just since uh, since he's he's passing last last week Friday, um, response from uh, both here and around the world. We've had fantastic. I mean, it's unbelievable. People from Australia, old people, Leo Williams, the son, Paul Williams. He was the ex-president of the uh, of the Australian Rugby Union phoning people from England phoning and so forth. Uh, to a you know, letter through Saru by the end of the day, sending, uh, saying obviously they, they said a year about the passing. But the, the main fraternity of people, uh, you know, making contact are the people that he stayed in contact with that were very close to his heart. You know, my dad had few friends. That is the one thing. But those friends that he had were his true friends. Yeah. He had lots of friends in the legal fraternity. Those are the type of people that contacted him immediately. His old rugby friends from the from the days gone by that immediately phoned them, you know, old, old people from the athletics fraternity, you know, because he sponsored sport and athletics and all those sorts of things, uh, been sending condolences and messages, and that was so fantastic to hear about those other people who knew the true uh, version of Relay like that that wasn't the public persona, you know. So it is fantastic to hear people and the comments that they make about him, and, and yes, it's sad that sometimes you hear that after the fact, you know, mm-hmm. but. Uh, at least the memories, the good memories of him will survive, and that is the fantastic thing for us as a family. Of course, one of the uh, the big sort of uh, moments in, in you know in the, in the life and career of, of Dr. Late was um, you know over the front pages when when he went to court with uh, with our former president Mandela. Uh, what's the relationship just from a government point of view subsequent to that, and even up until now? I mean, have you heard from any? high-profile government people? Has there been any response from them, any comment from them at all, or nothing? You know, um, I think uh, Esau Pahat had actually made a comment in the paper about it, but that's about the only comment that they had. But you must understand one thing about Doc, and that is that his favorite person in government, unfortunately, is not there anymore. Mm. Uh, he's actually a world traveler now, and that is Thabo Mbeki, mm. because Thabo Mbeki was actually my dad's how can I say, ideal president. He was. He saw him as the leader of South Africa. He had built up a relationship with him in the days when the ANC was banned. I mean, they they met in Frankfurt, they met in Harare. Yeah, he was very they involved shared. in that whole process, um, you know, amongst all the other people that, that had been involved sort of behind the scenes. He was one of them. He was one of them. And, and I mean, I can tell you this. I mean, they became very good friends. I mean, they, they shared a bottle of whiskey in Frankfurt. I mean, he came back and he told me, you know, what nice intellectual conversations they had. And he was extremely fond of them. So, you know, those are the type of people that obviously aren't around anymore. And Steve Twitter, people always thought that uh, there was a very acrimonious relationship between him and Steve Twitter. And even though they were adversity, adversaries in court, I mean, he still had a great fondness for Steve Twitter. And he misses those people. But, you know, time has now moved on. And... Um, you know, the, obviously the government has changed, so you you know you don't hear those sort of people speaking out about it, and uh, a lot of those people have also passed on. So yeah. that's the unfortunate factor. Well, uh, I do know that there are uh, a couple of tributes. I know you have a private cremation coming up. Uh, I think it's next week, and then after that, an opportunity for people to pay their last respects to your dad in Durban and in Joburg. Can you just give us the details, Louis? Yeah, no, we, we had him, but we, had, we don't want to call them memorial services and things like that because my dad wasn't that type of person. He wanted to celebrate life, not, uh, not mourn it. And we're having uh, what we call a tribute. The one will be at some Beachy Country Club uh, here in Belita, KwaZulu Natal. It's on Wednesday at 2.30. And the other tribute we're doing would be at the Saint and Sun in, uh, in Johannesburg on Friday, also at 2.30. So it's on the, on the, uh, on the uh, 6th and on the 8th. Uh, we're doing two tributes. Uh, on first, unfortunately, space is limited, you know, yeah. and we're asking people if they are going to attend to actually just contact uh, my PA just to make sure that, we, you know, we can accommodate, you know, the various people that want to come to the event and pay their tributes. All right. I have got those details. Uh, I did get the, uh, the the SMS over the weekend. So um, I'll pass this on to Maz, if, if possible. We can maybe put it up on our website and tweet it as well. Uh, and it's basically anybody who wants to go and pay tribute, they can uh, they can attend either one, right? They can do. We're not. We're not limiting people okay. that they are going to be coming. So by the end of the day, if it's a new doc, and you know they had a special place for him, and, and you know that's that's how it is. So yeah, absolutely. Well, he certainly, uh, when it comes to interviewing people, he certainly taught me one or two things as well in my career. So, I mean, he's uh, definitely contributed. But, yeah, uh, I always thoroughly enjoyed engaging with him. And, as I say, he, uh, he always treated me with the utmost respect. 
and uh, it's, uh, I was really sad to hear about his passing. Uh, once again, our condolences to you and, uh, and to all the family, uh, Louis, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you next week at, uh, at the Joburg one. Thank you very much, Darren, and like I said, his fondness for you straight very far, and I appreciate all the kind words. Thanks, Louis. All the best. Bye-bye. Cheers, Take bye-bye. Care. Bye-bye. Louis Late Jr., mm. Louis' son, mm. joining us on uh, Balls Visual Radio. Yeah. There, he's just thinking back is some massive, massive moments. Um, that uh, he was involved in um, the history not only of uh, rugby in this yeah, country but I also the citizen the, the citizen newspaper. late lager John Fertilizer yep that's where I think he made all his fortunes and he also had his downtimes as well where things just didn't work for him you know but uh, when it came down to making money for the uh, the Lions and uh, SA Rugby good business I had, I had many a bri with Louis Late Jr. and bri. Uh, a bri <laughs> no a bri there <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also a wonderful person and, uh, you know, when he introduced, it, he introduced me to his dad one day at their house, it was just something very special. It was you know, he's just a dynamic person. All right, now, there was a lot of stuff in the newspaper, or something. I didn't uh, see the papers this weekend, but there was apparently articles or something written in the papers. Yes, there was indeed, Dan's Darren, gonna and about. Dan's going to talk about that, saying that there are a lot of untruths, apparently, in, those, uh, in, in some of those uh, statements that were made. All right. This is Balls Visual Radio. Darren, Simon, Kate, and John. Weekdays from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Central African Time. Balls.co.za.